One of the world's leading authorities on the volatility of financial markets is Professor Robert Engel. Professor Engel is director of New York University's Stern School of Business, and amongst his many accolades, he is the winner of the Nobel Prize for Economics. Professor Engel has been collaborating with Finzia and the University of New South Wales Institute of Global Finance on the establishment of a global systemic risk index. I spoke with Professor Engel from New York. Reflecting on the work you've been doing in systemic risk over the past few years, I'd like to get a picture of where you see global banking, say the top 20, in 2015 compared with 2010. Well, as, as you know, we calculate what we think the financial strength of these banks would be in the face of another financial crisis. And we ask each, we estimate each bank and uh, financial institution around the world, how much capital would they need to raise in order to continue to function normally if we have another financial crisis? And if you add those numbers up for the whole global economy, you have some measure of how the financial system as a whole is looking. And when we do that, we see that there's been a big improvement since 2012, 2013, but it's really only about the same as it was in 2010 and not nearly as low as we would like it to be. So, I think that th we're seeing some improvement, but not nearly enough yet. In terms of the historical data you've drawn upon, how does 2015 compare with earlier periods? And is there a, a high watermark for systemic stability in a global economy? For systemic stability, well, you know, the further back we go, the more stable it looks. Um, and I mean, we have only gone back, we can only go back easily to about 2000. But honestly, I think that, that these pressures have been building over time as the financial institutions get more involved in, in, uh, in competitive and, uh, and expansionary uh, products. And so the, the risks have gone up peaking in, uh, in 2008 and then peaking again in uh, 2012. So I guess the golden era would be, you know, well before the financial crisis started. Looking at it from a regional perspective, I know the measures you've developed take a, a health check on the global economy, but I wonder if there's any insights you can draw upon about the structural features that apply separately to Europe, North America and Asia. Yes, we see the, this uh, this global picture is really very different for the three continents, as you, as you mentioned. In the U.S., there has been a substantial improvement. It is it is uh, considerably uh, lower measures of risk now than we've had since well before the financial crisis. Um, in, uh, in Europe, things are, have come down a little bit, but are still very high, and we think the risk has remained quite high. When you look at Asia, you see a totally different picture. It's been increasing very dramatically from basically a, a, a period at, or before the financial crisis where there seemed to be no risk to a small increase during the financial crisis of 2008 and then skyrocketing increases uh, since then. And if you kind of decompose that part into the, the part which is due to the, the, the biggest economies, you see that uh, Japan has been high for several years now. It, there is an improvement, I think, associated with the beginning of Abe economics, but it hasn't improved since then. It, it's just like there's a drop in the, in the S risk, but to just a new level. And in China, the increase has been very dramatic over the last two or three years with a surprising reversal in the last couple of months, which are due to the 
rapid increase in the Shanghai stock market over that period. And, you know, that's a topic we could spend a lot of time on, but it, it does have the possibility that the, that the banking sector in China will look better from uh, now going forward, but, but I don't know whether this is just a temporary bubble or whether this is something that's going to uh, sustain. And what are your thoughts on the Australian economy and the big four banks in this period? Well, you know, the thing about Australia is from our measures, it's a little bit boring because the banks actually look pretty strong. We see, we, we see that, that at, le at least the, the big four, uh, at, at most, one of them might need to raise a little capital if we have a financial crisis, but the, the, uh, the leverage ratios, that is the debt to equity ratios for these banks are all uh, less than 10, which is a, a strong sign. And so basically our, our view is that at least from a global perspective, it doesn't look like uh, the Australian banks are, are uh, very risky in, in the systemic sense. I wonder if you could explain the main parts of the systemic risk index and how you go about measuring volatility around the world. Absolutely. What, what, we, what we are trying to do is essentially a stress test. We're trying to Im, uh, consider what happens to the capital base of a financial institution when there is a stress. And the stress that we consider is that the global equity market goes down by 40% over the next six months. And what that does to financial institutions everywhere in the world is it means that their valuations of their assets and consequently their uh, equity, uh, their market cap will decline. So our way of estimating how much the market cap declines is to use what you would more or less think of as the beta of the stock, except that we estimate it in a fairly uh, flexible, dynamic way that allows it to change from, from day to day. So when the global market goes down by 40 percent, if, if you know, Commonwealth Bank has a beta of one and a half, we might expect its market cap to go down by more than 40 percent. And we would then ask, is this re reduced market cap sufficient so that it has uh, risk of failure and would need to raise capital. And uh, we have a capital ratio implicit in that. We think that under stress, the capital ratio should be something like 8% of total assets, which is a little bit high, but that's because we're not talking about a bankruptcy. We're talking about what a firm might need in order to function normally. So that's how we do the calculation. And there is a little bit of econometrics in how we estimate these time-varying uh, betas and volatilities, but that's the fundamental uh, model behind it. Can we also talk about how the index has been received in policy circles outside of academia? Are you surprised or otherwise with the way regulators have received the insights? Are you reassured they're, they're taking it into account when adjusting their, their policy settings around the world? We, we have done a lot of work uh, presenting these results to regulators, presenting to private sector uh, institutions, um, and we've done a lot of work ourselves comparing how closely our estimates of the risk compare with, with what comes out of the regulatory stress tests. And there are a lot of differences, extraordinary differences between the way we're doing this, but in some respects the results are fairly similar. Uh, the main, uh, I would say, difference between these two, and the most fundamental difference, is that we use uh, equity market values to value these financial institutions, and regulators use uh, accounting measures to uh, talk about capital adequacy. And notions like tier one capital, uh, are accounting measures, 
and they're usually measured relative to risk-weighted assets, whereas we think the risks should be measured in terms of the stress, which is the way we get the beta. So we use total assets, not risk-weighted assets. So I think that the risk weights is one difference and the use of accounting values of equity is another. And my view is that, that um, regulators should continue to do the excellent job that they mostly are doing using uh, supervisory data to come up with estimates. But it takes them a long time. They don't get time series information. And if they come up with estimates which are very different from what the market values it, in other words, different from ours, it's important that we try to compare and rationalize them. Because we have a lot of information about the dynamics of financial institutions' health. And the regulators see a much more static kind of picture. And uh, so I think they're complements to each other.